Syrian refugee is living out the script of the 2004 Tom Hanks starrer, The Terminal. He's made friends with the staff and showers in the terminal's bathrooms, but there's a difference too. Hassan Al Kontar is stuck in Kuala Lumpur, not New York. And unlike Hanks, who's a citizen of the made up Krakosia in the movie, Al Kontar is from a very real country facing a very real war, Syria. He's been stranded at the Kuala Lumpur budget terminal for the past 56 days. He's been posting videos detailing his daily life on Twitter and Facebook and has attracted the attention of human rights groups and the media alike. He's even tagged Tom Hanks and called his plight the Terminal 2 in several of his tweets. I did not see my family since uh, almost nine years now. I lost my father. I, I could not attend the funeral. This is a story of hundreds of Syrians who, is stuck, who are stuck in the airports. Uh, suffering because of uh, their nationality and uh, uh, passport they are holding. Uh, airlines are, are not allowing us to board because of our nationality. We are facing a kind of racism uh, uh, and hateness, rejected, unwanted. Al Kontar occasionally splurges on a coffee, but he ends up shelling out a little extra to get the airport staff to get it to him. When it's time to sleep, he stretched out, stretches out as best as he can on the floor or on the usually rather uncomfortable seats on offer at most airports. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, 10 a.m. here in Kuala Lumpur International Airport. Yesterday night, I slept for uh, four hours straight with no, with no breakups. It felt good. I can feel my strength again. Um, I start my plans today to get some coffee. I'm still working on it. It, it will happen. It will take some time, but it will happen. I can, I can feel the coffee now and smell it. I need it, uh, but it takes some time. Al Kantar left his home in Syria in 2006 to avoid compulsory military service. He sought out a more prosperous life in the UAE, but after the Syrian civil war started, the Syrian embassy refused to renew his travel documents. His resident visa wasn't issued either. He was then expelled from the UAE. Since then, he's been unable to seek asylum in any other country. And joining me this evening on the fine print from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia is Hassan Al Konta himself. Hassan, good evening. I've read uh, that you're still wanted in Syria. Why exactly is that? Yes, uh, in Syria we have a compulsory military service. Yearly, you need to uh, to send uh, an official document to your from your embassy to uh, to the military office in your town, just to delay or postpone your military service, not to be wanted. But in 2011, they uh, I could not send that document, so I become a wanted. You need five documents, then after that you need to pay a, a certain amount. It was before the war; it was three thousand five hundred dollars. But when the war started, they raise it until it reach eight thousand dollars. So I was not having that much of money, so I become wanted. Since then, my last visit to Syria was in December two thousand eight. Can I ask you, um, where is your family right now, Hassan? Are they in the UAE? Are they in Syria? Where are they? They are in Syria. I lost my father in 2016, 31-12-2016, uh, New Year's Eve. I could not attend his funeral because I'm wanted in Syria. And uh, that's a time of a sadness, you know, it will never leave you, you know, to keep uh, uh, feeling that you failed him, and you was not there uh, during his sickness or the time he wanted you to be support him. So uh, I'm, I'm paying the price, I'm paying the bill of others who are in our land. I, uh, I refuse to join the fight not because I'm a coward, but because I uh, believe in peace and love. It's not our fight. Uh, it's not my, I'm not a killing machine or a bad killing machine to kill my own brothers or to uh, destroy my own home. So I uh, I refuse this fight. I refuse that war is not an answer. War is not, war is not a solution. Blood will bring only blood. So uh, and you as a, a, an Indian nation, a great nation who has a, a great icon like Mahatma Gandhi, will know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, with the non-violence uh, solutions you approach like the uh, French occupation. Right. So uh, 
And that's why I choose to speak to you at the channel today, because your people will understand me, but war is not the solution. Well, we really appreciate, uh, Hassan, uh, you speaking with us. Can I ask you, though, where exactly are you hopeful of going from here? Is anyone helping you in that process? Uh, now, uh, there is some news. Uh, I don't know if it's a good news or a bad news. We did not get the result yet, but uh, it's a news at least. Some amazing volunteers. Uh, they are mainly from Canada. They uh, get all the uh, necessary documents. Uh, sponsor association, private sponsor association, lawyer, and they raise the money as well. So they submit all the documents to the uh, Canadian government. And we are waiting the response of the immigration minister there, and hopefully it will take time. I can understand that. I can respect the procedure and the internal law in the of the all people and uh, among their safety first. So it, it may take time, but this is the only uh, solution. This is the only people who approach me and give me a solution. All the other world who it's since 20 days, almost 20 days now, they are just uh, scooping me and uh, in the terminal move for them, but uh, none of the governments and authorities who say that uh, they are the Syrian people friends, right. none of them has, I am here actually because at least two of them, only Canada was uh, and is a great nation, a government who give me their hand to help. Okay. Um, there's so That's much all. noise behind you, obviously, because you are at the, a terminal of an airport after all. Lots of people catching their flights. Hassan, you uh, brought up the movie The Terminal, and of course, there have been many comparisons to the movie. But do you feel that that takes away from the seriousness of your situation, or do you feel it's helped you out? Both are correct. At the beginning, it was correct, yes. Uh, it's... Uh, it's actually the terminal. Uh, when people start uh, pointing it as a, the uh, terminal movie, uh, I watched it like uh, 10 or 11 years ago, then I uh, re-download it and uh, download it again and re-watch it. And uh, yes, it's very similar. But uh, I, uh, when he was uh, trying, uh, how he was trying to eat or take a shower or uh, sleep, right. it's very similar in the uh, temporary daily problems. But it's still a show. And uh, this is a real uh, show here. It's difficult to spend 24 hours in a, an airport stuck to a certain area, uh, limited access. But uh, yes, you can have an idea through the terminal itself. I'm still missing one thing from the terminal. He has a crush on Catherine Victor Jones. I'm still looking at the flight attendants. Maybe I will see her face, but. No luck so far. <laughs> well, best of luck, Hassan, in, uh, of course, finding your Catherine Zeta-Jones and, of course, in uh, making your way across to Canada. Hopefully, that's where it seems that you're headed uh, next. Thank you also for speaking with us this evening on uh, Fine Print. We appreciate you taking out the time. Right, uh, let's... Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Okay. Benjamin Netanyahu, who was uh, taking on favorite enemy Iran, claiming new revelations about his nuclear weapons program. Weon's West Asia Bureau Chief Daniele Pagani, however, notes that much of Netanyahu's revelations are old hat and that the International Atomic Energy Agency had documented extensive details of Iran's nuclear program already. Take a look. The largely pro-Western international media is going to town with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's latest broadside against the Iran nuclear deal. First, Iran lied about never having a nuclear weapons program. 100,000 secret files prove that they lied. Second, even after the deal, Iran continued to preserve and expand its nuclear weapons knowledge for future use. Why would a terrorist regime hide and meticulously catalog its secret nuclear files if not to use them at a later date? Third, Iran lied again in 2015 when it didn't come clean to the IAEA as required by the nuclear deal. And finally, the Iran deal, the nuclear deal, is based on lies. It's based on Iranian lies and Iranian deception. 
100,000 files right here prove that they lied. U.S. President Donald Trump was quick to respond, claiming the intelligence proved his assertion that Iran was cheating and the deal was the worst ever. Ditto his newly appointed Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. But UK, France and Germany, the three European signatories to the Iran deal are still backing it with enough reason. The existence of Project Ahmad, Iran's designation for the nuclear program, was known to the International Atomic Energy Agency in 2015 when it filed its final assessment on Iran's nuclear capabilities. The IAEA report read, and I quote, The information indicated that activities commenced in the late 1980s and became focused in the early 2000s within projects in the Ahmad plan. The agency assesses that before the end of 2003, an organizational structure was in place in Iran suitable for the coordination of a range of activities relevant to the development of a nuclear explosive device. Although some activities took place after 2003, they were not a part of the coordinated effort. Netanyahu said there was now proof that Iran planned to conduct tests and feasibility studies to build nuclear weapons, but the IAEA knew about this too. The 2015 report read, and I quote, By November 2011, the agency had received information from member states indicating that prior to 2004 and between 2005 and 2009, Iran had undertaken computer modeling studies of various component agreements which were only specific to nuclear explosive configurations based on implosion technology. Netanyahu's other so-called revelation that Israeli intelligence came to know that Iran had studied how to integrate a nuclear warhead on their Shabab 3 medium-range ballistic missile was known to the IAEA and the US. The body's final report read, and I quote, Extensive information provided to the agency within the alleged studies documentation prior to November 2011 indicate a detailed project work conducted in Iran in 2002-2003 to examine how to integrate a new spherical payload into the existing payload chamber of the re-entry vehicle for the Shabab 3 missile. Many documents still need to be analyzed and further details could emerge. For now, the most relevant discovery is that at a certain point, Iran moved its entire nuclear-related documentation to a secret location, a decision Tehran will need to explain. In Amman, with Daniel Pagani, Guru Report, Vion. Joining me on the broadcast from Amman in Jordan is Vion's West Asia Bureau Chief, Daniele Pagani. Daniele, good evening. Thanks uh, for that report. Is there actually uh, anything new in what Israel is claiming to have discovered? Most of uh, what uh, Benjamin Netanyahu said uh, was already known to the international community and to all the signatories of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, including the United States for that matter. Uh, as we said in our report, this is just a small excerpt of what he repeated because actually the list is way longer. At least 10 of the points that Netanyahu made were already known by the International Agency of Atomic Energy, which is the body which was in charge of uh, writing the final assessment, uh, which was uh, the basis of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, so I would say that largely what he said right now was not new. What is contained in the document uh, might actually provide uh, further details on the real status of Iran's uh, nuclear implementation and Iran's uh, nuclear uh, research for military purposes. Uh, there is one question which remains on the table, and the question is why Tehran did try to hide these documents in order to not uh, get them into public domain. So this is a question that Tehran will need somehow to answer. Absolutely. And, and you know, the rhetoric from the United States on the Iran nuclear deal has sort of been staccato. We hear from President Trump, then we hear silence. Do you think we need to make note of the timing of Mr. Netanyahu's accusations as well? Why do you think this is happening right now? I definitely agree. We do need to take note about what is happening. Remember that Mike Pompeo, the newly elected Secretary of State of the United States, uh, was here in Amman uh, 24 hours ago. And prior to this, he was in Saudi Arabia. And he also met Netanyahu, and they have been talking uh, largely about Iran and the threat that, according to them, Iran poses to West Asia. Uh, Donald Trump has been very vocal in saying that uh, the Iran nuclear deal is the worst deal ever, and he is uh, very much willing to walk away. Remember, on the 12th of May, he's going to take a final call on whether the United States will remain or not in this agreement. 
so the timing is definitely not uh, uh, something which is happening by chance, but it's something very much calculated. Also, we know that this kind of information that Netanyahu is giving to public domain was known by the United States since March, at least. So they decided to put it out now in order to, I would say, drum up the rhetoric against Iran and perhaps prepare the exit of the United States uh, uh, from the nuclear deal. Absolutely. And, and of course, uh, you know, France's own president has been uh, speaking about the nuclear deal when he was in the U.S. Stay with me a second, uh, Daniele, since you did bring up uh, the fact that the rhetoric has been ongoing. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, what's happening when it comes to other parties and how they've reacted to the Israeli prime minister's accusations. First of all, Benjamin Netanyahu is no stranger to using visual props for his big ticket presentations and Monday's PowerPoint on why he thinks Iran has run afoul of the 2015 nuclear deal was no exception either. But beyond the United States, the Silicon Valley style big reveal didn't get the response Bibi was probably looking for. The UN atomic watchdog, for instance, has declined to directly address Mr. Netanyahu's accusations, saying, quote, in line with standard IAEA practice, the IAEA evaluates all safeguards, the relevant information available to it. However, it is not the practice of the IAEA to publicly discuss issues related to any such information, end quote. Now, uh, the, uh, as far as the statement from France goes, it took things a little further. In light of Mr. Netanyahu's allegations, its foreign ministry spokesperson said, quote, this information should be studied and evaluated in detail. The new information presented by Israel could also confirm the need for longer-term assurances on the Iranian program as the president has proposed. End quote. Remember, the United Kingdom has also made a similar statement. Now, the newly appointed U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo gave an expected thumbs up to Israel's allegations, but even he declined to say whether the documents were evidence of Iran violating the nuclear deal. Despite the hype some experts and diplomats felt, Netanyahu's presentation lacked the smoking gun appeal of a blockbuster revelation. However, there was consensus that it could strengthen Trump's demand to scrap the deal. I think that the, uh, the publication by Prime Minister Netanyahu and its timing was aimed not to pressure President Trump, but to support a decision that was already made by the the, the president. I know that uh, National Security Advisor Bolton has said that the president has not yet made his decision, but my sources in Israeli uh, uh, administration and intelligence claim that they understood from their American counterpart. Daniele Pagani continues to be with us on the broadcast from Amman. Daniele, uh, keeping everything in mind in terms of what we've heard as far as uh, Israel and the U.S. rhetoric on Iran goes, do you think that the risk of uh, the, of a conflict runs high at this point. My personal understanding and reading of the situation is that actually, despite of the very, I mean, warlike rhetoric, uh, we're not going towards a direct confrontation between Iran on one side and allies that they might find, and Israel and Saudi Arabia and the United States on the other side. It's too dangerous for all the parties to, um, to, to start a direct conflict, which could, which could eventually turn into the Third World War, truly, this time. Uh, what perhaps uh, Netanyahu is trying to do is, A, to present to the world of the decision which uh, the analysts we have uh, just heard say that it has already been made by Donald Trump to walk away from the deal like a heroic and needful and needed decision. Second, remember that Israel is conducting a parallel war in Syria, so the fact that according to Israeli Iran is uh, acting uh, and uh, uh, breaching the agreement of the nuclear deal kind of uh, provides political uh, sort of political armor, I would say, for Israel to conduct its operations. So, no, I would say that this is to put pressure on Tehran, to tell Tehran that they know what Tehran has been doing for years, so that they have their documents, and uh, not to, to retaliate when it comes to attacks within Syrian territories conducted by Israel, and not also to retaliate eventually if Trump decides to walk away from the deal. It's a game of chess, I would say, very high-level tactic. Absolutely. Uh, we'll have to leave it at that. Daniele, thank you for giving us that perspective from uh, West Asia. It's a story that... Uh 
And as the royal wedding in Britain draws closer, Meghan Markle seems to have a lot on her plate. And we're not just talking about dinner menus and wedding preparations alone. There's another event that might be giving the American TV star the jitters. She's probably busy brushing up her knowledge of historical facts and trivia pertaining to Britain. Because even though she's marrying a prince and into the royal family, she'll still have to ace a life in the UK test before she becomes a British citizen. What's more, she'll have to get at least 18 out of the 24 questions correct. The test has been made harder over the years as an attempt to cut immigration figures and some say that even British citizens find the test extremely difficult. Areas of what is now Scotland were never conquered by the Romans. Uh, it was false because we did. No, 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 we did. Oh, they didn't. It was Yorkshire. That's right. I should have known that. I'm from Yorkshire. Northern Ireland and Wales each have their own church of state. I'm going to go... Oh, dear. I got that wrong. Saint Dean Mahomet. No idea who he is. The novels by Charles Dickens are Great Expectations and Oliver Twist, yeah? Yes. Not Harry Potter. And no, 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 no. Pride no. and Prejudice. Mm. Correct.